Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon is over Malachi chapter 2, entitled Marriage Mess, part 3. Ephesians 5, we've been for three weeks now, third week together, talking about, uh, well, the title of the sermon series is Marriage Mess, because that's where we find it. Not trying to make a slide remark on marriage, just that's where it seems to be in our culture anymore. It seems to be a mess. And uh, it's not the only thing that's a mess. Uh, but it is a mess for the same reasons that other things are a mess, and that our culture has divorced itself and its people from the God who created it. And so therefore, how can we expect marriage to work when God created marriage, and yet we don't want God involved in our marriage? How can we expect our lives to work when we, God created our lives, but we don't want God involved in our lives? We don't, how do we expect business to work when we, God created that, but uh, we don't want him to be involved in that? And so it's just uh, why, why we're in a mess. So, But marriage mess is what we've been looking at. And we're going to be in Ephesians 5, and, and again, um, the way we get out of the mess is we have to do the things the way the Creator. How do we get out of it? Well, we have to go back to the designer. We have to go back to the architect, and we have to do it. We have to do it His way. Uh, we can't just say, well, that's good advice. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of what you got to say, a little bit of what a Buddha has to say, and et cetera, and try to come up with an idea of what I think marriage ought to be. And you're going to get what you got coming to you when you do that, because God, Buddha didn't create it. God did. Uh, Confucius or none of these other crazies did any of that. Only God did. And so if you want to go back, to, and, and if you want to do it right, then you're going to have to say, his word is law. Is that okay? His, can you say that over your life? Because that's really what we need to say. His word is law over my life. And whatever it says, where it disagrees with what I believe, the way I've been acting, the way I've been thinking, what I've been taught, I will change. I don't change the word, it changes me. So let's go back and see what the architect has to say about our marriages. And you're not going to like this. I mean, maybe you will, but uh, our, our culture, I should say, is not going to like what God says about marriage. But I will say, it only works, it only really works this way. Verse 21 of Ephesians 5, did I tell you to go to Ephesians 5? I've already rambled on, Ephesians 5? Okay. Verse 21 says, be subject to one another, in fear of Christ. Now that word subject there is just that, submissive to each other, sub subjected to each other. All right? it, it is never mentioned again in the rest of this text, even though the next verse says, wives be subject to your husbands. It, if you have the New American Standard, and maybe the Inter New International and a couple of other newer translations, you'll notice that subject is in, print, is in italics. It, it's supplied. It is not there. Uh, it, is, it is there. That's the reason why they supply it. My problem with it is that it's also supplied under the heading of husband as well, I believe. Because this is a, a mutual subjection. The wife subjects herself to the leadership of the husband, as we're going to see. The husband subjects himself by giving himself entirely up for the sake of the wife. I, by the way, I don't know about you guys, but gentlemen, I think that's a bigger subjection, frankly. I've got to give my whole life up? She's just got to follow my leadership. I've got to get my whole life up for this woman? Yes, that's what it says. Check it out. Verse 22. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands that is subject in everything. Say so you don't like it. I didn't write. But I'm telling you, these are the rules. And you break the rules, you're, gonna, you're, you're breaking a marriage. You say, you don't like it. I don't, I, I, do I care? Yeah, I care. I'm just saying I didn't write it, and this is not for us to decide whether, it's, whether we like it or not. And God's not making a suggestion here. He's just saying, this is how it works. You don't know my husband. He's a knucklehead. I, I believe me. I, believe, I think he is. <laughs> I know my wife's husband pretty well. And I frankly don't. I wish, I wish it was the other way around. I'd rather follow her. She's smarter. She's more capable. She knows a lot more than I do about a lot of things. But, but it's, again, it's not, it doesn't have any qualifications about your husband here. It doesn't say follow smart husbands. It just says husband. You got a husband? You only got one? <laughs> then, ladies, you should follow his leadership because God is going to lead your family through him. It, it has nothing to do with him. It's, he, he qualifies just by simply having the title. He doesn't have to have anything going on between his ears or anywhere else. <laughs> and, and, may, and may very well not. But that is, who, that is the way God created the order. You want God to bless your marriage, you, do, you follow his order of things. Okay, so let's get to the second thing here. So be subject, right? And, and, that, that, and, and notice here's the subjection of the husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. So that means he just says he loves us. 
How did he love the church? By giving, giving himself up for her? Now hang on a minute. I'll send her a card every once in a while, tell her that I love her, but I'm, not, I'm doing what I want to do. So again, you break the rules, you break a marriage. Because that's the way you're running it, gentlemen. Here's, Christ is the example of how you're to be a husband to your wife. How much did he give up? Everything. Heaven, authority, rights, privileges, his whole life. He was subjected to torture and shame in public, in public for the sake of the wife, the church. That is how you husband your wife. That is how you do it. And you think that's not subjection, I, I, I don't, just don't know what your definition of that would be. That he might sanctify her. Notice he does everything for his wife, having cleansed her by the washing with the water for the word, and that he might present her to himself as a church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle and such. He does this all for her. He's, he completely gives himself up for her. So, but that she should be holy and blameless, but so husbands ought to also in the same way, if you will, love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. So we're back and forth between the, what are we talking about, marriage? We're talking about Jesus here. So it's either, I thought we were talking about marriage. So let's talk about marriage, and then we can get on to Jesus. And, and Paul mixes the two, because they are clearly mixed. Marriage was created to give a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. It is holy, it is sacred, therefore. Don't enter into it lightly. It's not just something to move in and move out of. Because you're, you're damaging the reputation of God himself, and I would say that's not a good thing. So, so that, again, back and forth here, and then he, he quotes where we've been in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 2, for the cause of marriage, this cause. A man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a mystery is great. He's talking about this oneness. But he says, you're, you're not, but you're not listening to me. I'm not talking about marriage. He says, I'm speaking about reference to the Christ and the church. That's the premier. Secondary, and as an example, marriage was created. So marriage is an example of the relationship between Christ and his church, and therefore holds this incredible, such an incredible, nothing else is created to look like it. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his wife even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respects her husband. So again, we have this here, the bottom line question here, wives, are you willing to live for your husband? And husbands, are you willing to give up your life for your wife? That is marriage. That is biblical marriage. That is what God has. Anything less is not from Him. And anything less is in danger of destruction, and really is. I mean, our, our whole society, marriage-wise, has completely fallen apart because we've completely divorced ourselves from this, and so thus we're divorcing ourselves from each other because we can't make it. We've lost God, and we've lost each other, and we can't figure out why. And we're too dumb to go back to the original creator. And it's such a shame. So, so, so on, onward. As I said, we've been using Malachi. This is where we were in Malachi. And I put a couple of the important verses that we were there in chapter 2 of Malachi chapter uh, 2, verses 11 through 16. This whole discussion of and where we're jumping off from to discuss this whole issue of marriage and divorce. And, and so he makes a statement here. And we're going to read it again here just to illustrate what God's speaking of here. The Lord has been a witness how important marriage is to him. Has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously. So he's defending, in this case, the wife against the husband who is treacherous toward her. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, for I hate divorces. That's what he's doing. We didn't read it, but it, basically he's quitting the current wife or the first wife and going after some wild fling some exotic woman. That's exactly what's happening. The Lord says, I hate this. I hate divorce, says the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. And, and him who covers his garment with wrong, and uh, say, say the Lord, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your, to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously, he says. It's treacherous, he says. He hates it, he says. In, in particular here, need, need to comment on the type of divorce that God is speaking of here. It's an aggressive divorce where this man in this patriarchal society uh, which means men had all total control, 100%. Women had no rights whatsoever. Uh, decided they were just sick of the old lady, and so they found a young thing that would go out with them, and so they just said bye to the, to the wife of their youth that they committed in covenant before God, disrespecting them, but most importantly God in that process, and running after this fling. God says, I hate that. 
And, and so they were just exercising a right they should not have had, and God just is standing in on behalf of, in this case, on behalf of the woman, as, as rightly he should. When God says he hates divorce, um, he says it with regards to all divorce. It's not just this kind of divorce. You know, um, what, 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 is, what is a common divorce anymore is just the irreconcilable differences, right? We're friends. And let me just say this to you very clearly, the Bible, in the Bible, and, and otherwise, God hates that. God, what would you expect him to say? I love that. You know, there's some I hate, but there's some that I just think is awesome. It's the best thing for both of you to go and live selfish lives. What do you want him to say? I mean, really, come on. No. He's going to say what, we, what he should say, which is, I hate it. But specifically in this case, in this context, as we're reading here, he says he hates this total disregard of vows, the breaking of, of love commitment and for the sake of a fling, as he should say, as it should be. And there, there are always two people in divorce, and God's language is always against the perpetrator. It always is. And in this case, it's the guy. It is. And God places all the blame at the feet of these men who are acting heinously, and it should be, and he defends the plight of the women, as it should be in this case. They're to blame. The women are defenseless, and he's defending them. So in some cases, he's defending the divorcee, and in other cases, he's accusing the divorcee, and that's kind of the way it is. So, so but listen, divorce happens for the same reason every time. You know what it is? Now I know you say, well, there's adultery, and there's irreconcilable differences, and there's you know, she ran out on me with the money, and et cetera, et cetera. No, there's only one reason for divorce ever. It is called sin. Sin causes all divorces. Can we all agree that if we get rid of all sin from our relationships, that we would cease to have divorces? Can we all say amen to that? Amen. Amen. It is sin that causes divorces. Sin is the cause of every divorce. Sometimes uh, the blame is to both parties and, and equally shared, and sometimes it's lopsided, as in the case of the one we have here on the screen in Malachi. And Sometimes no matter what we do to preserve marriage, because it takes two to tango, they dissolve. Because the other person is just simply not willing. For whatever sinful reason, they want out, and bottom line is, in our culture, you can't ultimately stop them. It is inevitable. So, so they say, I say that to say that we should never have a one-size-fits-all evaluation of all divorces and divorcees. Because God does not. God does not. Again, I lost the screen here. I lost the whole thing here. Hang on. There we go. I'm going to put this down. Because <laughs> I don't know what I did. He, 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 he hates, he hates what, it, what people do, as in this case. Just a a lame-headed individual going out and having a fling on a wife that he's committed before God to just because he can. He says, I hate that. He hates what, he hates what people do, as in the case, and it hate, he hates what it does. You know what it does to a woman in this culture, by the way? It's a patriarchal culture, which means she couldn't get a job. It means she's out. I mean, she's going to be begging on the streets pretty quick. Unless some other husband takes her up, which they would not, because she's divorced. And so, what, so he hates what this man does, and he hates what it does to the woman. And he, so, like I said, what will we expect him to say about divorce other than, I hate it? What will we expect? And, and, and leaves this woman, and so it is, it, that's the way it is. And he, he hates what it does, despite what a person's best efforts are. In many cases, the person that they've committed their whole life to walks out of them and leaves them brokenhearted, broken life. I committed my whole life to love this person and to be together with this person and was never closer to anyone other than this person. And now they've gone out and just, they're gone. And what that must do to a person, therefore, like I said, we might expect God to say he likes that. Of course not. It's treachery, he says. God, God is accusing some divorcees, and in, in other cases, he's defending them. And that's the way it ought to be. That's the way church ought to be. And let me just say this very carefully. We have a lot of people in this church, I would say the average person in Island Baptist Church has been through divorce. It's average here. And, you know, I'm, I'm not for keeping up averages, but it just is what it is. The average person has been through divorce here in our, our congregation, and, and, and let me just say this very clearly, it's not the unpardonable sin. There is one in the Bible, and it's not divorce. It's not. And we... I'm amazed, speaking, I can only speak from the Baptist culture because I'm a Baptist and I don't know, I know a bunch of you are from different cultures and 
Christian, Christian wise. And I don't know, I know y'all are all perfect in the Baptist church, though. So we got a lot of um, Pharisees. Because in the Baptist church that I grew up in, you could almost commit any sin and be in leadership, except get divorced. If you're divorced, you can't be a pastor, you can't be a deacon, you can't be in leadership, you can't teach Sunday school, you can't. Really? From where in the scriptures does it say that you're just eliminated from all kinds of leadership because, and, and, and maybe it was, you know, hello, maybe it wasn't your fault. For, I mean, I'm not saying, obviously, I'm not, and I'm, I'm not, I don't think God's completely defending this woman either. He's not saying, okay, she was completely without sin and this man just went out and did what he did. Obviously, she's a sinner just like the rest, just like the rest. Just, in this case, this guy holds the, the larger portion of it. Therefore, God's against him and defending her. So, so at the same time, I'm not saying all, you know, there is sin involved in both sides of divorce every single time, but sometimes it is lopsided, and I know that. And, and God knows that, and the church needs to know that. And so, therefore, we can't have one-size-fits-all dealings with divorce. We cannot do that. We don't play like that here. We don't have that kind of way of, of doing things. Let me give you the worst case scenario and tell me how you feel about it. So, so I've got a person who is solely at fault like this. Heinously destroys a marriage, walks out on his vows. Isn't there forgiveness if he repents? Isn't there biblically forgiveness? I do believe there is. And so this is a Bible church. That's what we do. Isn't there restoration if he repents? There is in heaven. Isn't there in God's house? I do believe there is. So we need to be real careful, like I said, this whole one-size-fits-all. And then, then in addition, isn't, isn't, there, isn't there always a place where the prodigal is accepted back? Don't we have a, always a door that says, come right on in to the center? The worst of them. Yeah, that is the way church ought to be. That's not the image we project, unfortunately, many times. So anyway, back to our, our pursuit of God's rules of how marriage should work, going back to the architect, back to his his line of things that we need to do. And we were in, um, see this little wand will work again. There we go. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 is where we've quoted already there, and we've seen it already in Ephesians. And, and we're ready to look at it again here in um, where its original context, which is in the book of Genesis. And uh, we've seen that last time, we've seen several times together how God has these rules, and we get it from this simple little uh, wedding service that God performed between the first two couple. He creates them, and then on the day he creates the second one, Eve, they get married. And this is what he says. Like I said, God was no Baptist preacher. He knew how to call off a service really quick. One sentence service. For the reason, this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined or cleaved to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. End of ceremony. Awesome. So from this, we gather four different things, and we've been pursuing these for the past couple of Sundays. Leaving, receiving, cleaving, and weaving. Leaving, receiving, cleaving, and weaving. And we've looked at the first two. First of all, leaving. The word here in the original Hebrew is, is a very drastic word. When it says leave, it literally means father and mother. It means you cut them off. You just cut them off. And, not, and I understand sometimes you've got to move in with mom and dad because money's tight and all that. I'm not saying that. But there better be a psychological wall between you and mom and dad. No matter how, and I've known people, it doesn't matter how far they move away, that, there is no wall. The mom and dad cross it and daughter and, da and son-in-law cross it and they should not because the Bible says, listen, you, here's the rules. Don't break them. You will break a marriage. Number one rule in this list that God gives us is that you're to leave father and mother, which implies all other relationships. Father and mother, the closest relationship a child has out of his, outside of his or her marriage. And so if I'm leaving father and mother, who else am I leaving? Everybody else. I cannot relate to you like I used to because I'm no longer single. I am one flesh with someone else. It's not just Bill anymore. It's me and my wife now. And you've got to deal with this that way. I, my loyalties have changed. My loyalty now belongs to my spouse. And listen, your spouse should never have to compete with your parents or with, with your friends or with anything else that you do. And you break these rules, though, and you will break a marriage. Well, she just doesn't call me as much anymore. Listen, ma'am, she's married. Leave them alone. Okay. He just doesn't want to go fish and play golf anymore. He's married. 
Leave them alone. Okay, the relationships have changed. Mom and dad, it's got to work that way, and it has to be a policy. Again, because it, it's biblical. We're not just making these things up. And we don't follow the rules, well, then we're not going to get what the opposite of the rule says. So first leaving, then receiving. God performs the ceremony here on the same day that Eve is created. So Adam and Eve are not knowing, they don't know the hand they're holding, and yet they're saying I do to each other. I had a wedding, it was interesting, last night. And the, the bride, no habla inglés. Well, actually, she's, I said it in Spanish, but actually she spoke Russian. <laughs> she didn't speak any English. And he had gone over the vows with her before the wedding so she would know, and all she could say in English was, I do. And so I said the whole service to him because he only spoke English, and then she knew, he said, just poke her, and she'll say, I do. And so I would go through, and then I said her vows, and then I poke her. <laughs> and she said, I do. <laughs> She's still a man, and I mean, it's still a wedding, it's still a marriage. But it's just another language. So, you know, and that's the bottom line. I mean, you just come down to it and say, I, I, I do. So these two people are saying, I do, on a day that they've met. So they had no, no time. They're just simply receiving each other on the basis that God brought them together. That's it. No time for performance. No time for looking at his looks or checking out his, doing a hard pull on his, I don't know, his, his finances or are, are, are feeling warm fuzzies. None of that. They don't have a chance to do any of that before they just say, I do. And they say, I do, strictly based upon the, I, the, the understanding that God has brought them to me. So hear me carefully on this. We said this last time. It is a fallacy based upon God bringing Adam and Eve together and them neither having an opinion or a vote nor given an option. It is a fallacy to think that our job is to find our mate. That is a fallacy. That is God's job. So your most important relationship outside of Christ on this earth, which is your spouse, and you're supposed to figure that out? Man, no wonder we're such a mess. No, that is God's job. You leave it to Him. You let Him do it. No, no performance, no looks, no income, none of that. I just simply need to be able to answer the question, is this the person that God has brought for me? Of course, predicated on that is that I have a relationship with God to begin with that could have that kind of caliber response. So I'm walking in my own little world, selfishly not doing the thing God wants me to do, except maybe going to church on a Sunday, and otherwise I'm expecting God to come through on such a big issue as marriage and me to really understand what he's saying to me. I'm sorry. You don't have a relationship with a person. You're not going to know when he's speaking to you. So, boy, do you need to have a relationship with him. Again, it's predicated on this that I understand when God is speaking to me. Otherwise, I'm going to be making some major mistakes. So, so, so when we make, listen, a marriage on the changeableness of human nature, on character, on our actions, we are headed for trouble. We are headed for trouble. But when we make marriage based upon the changelessness of God, then and only then does it work right. And I know God is gracious, and some of us up here were married outside of Christ, and we had no intentions of being right with Him whatsoever when we got married, and yet here we are, and God has made us into the married couple that we're supposed to be, and we're walking with Christ now and all that, and yeah, yeah, that's right. God does that. But it's not a reason to go out and just try it that way. I mean, you're asking for trouble. Why not, now that you know, why not do it God's way and then un 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 undo the possibility of it all coming apart because of our sinful natures, which, of course, we both bring into the marriage. So first of all, leaving, then receiving. And then now, thirdly, we're ready for the new stuff. Cleaving. The word literally means to be glued. That's what it means. Stuck together. So here's biblical marriage advice be stuck together under all circumstances in every situation at all times every day all seasons under all things be stuck together be glued to your wife be glued to your husband go the same places do the same things develop similar interests stick to one another limit what you want for the sake of the other again don't break the rules or you may very well break a marriage. Don't break the rules. I don't care what our culture says. Maybe I really do. Our culture, listen, guys, they're messed up. It's not working. Why, why would you do what our natural inclination, what everybody else is doing? Because their stuff is falling apart. We have a biblical rules here. Let's stick 
to it. It doesn't mean that you don't completely give, you completely give up on all your interests and that the other has no part with and that you just simply don't do anything that she doesn't do or that, that he doesn't do. I'm not saying that you don't do that, but you, listen, you limit it severely. Don't break the rules. H hear me on this. I got married when I was 22. There she is. I had, you know, by God's grace. But I had, I, had, I had interests and hobbies and pursuits when I married her. And when I married her, she became my interests, my hobbies, my pursuits. On my good days. <laughs> right, babe? On our good days, because that's what it makes it good. Listen, marriage is not one thing that you do. Marriage is the thing. It is the hub. It is not a spoke on the wheel. It's not just one of a multitude of things that are true about me. It is the central thing that is true about me outside of my relationship with Christ. It is the central thing. And if that is not good enough for you, listen to me. Don't get married. You're too selfish to handle that. <laughs> don't, don't get married. Because you're going to make a mess out of it. You really will. So it's back, back to this whole leaving thing. I have to leave in order to cleave, right? How can I not, how can I not leave my parents in order to cleave? I have to, I have to uh, uh, reassociate my, my priorities. So I reassociate my priorities from my, from my parents and my friends now to my wife, which is biblical, right? So I've got to reassociate also my priorities otherwise. I have all these priorities and interests. Now, listen, the, the wife or the husband has to become my, my priority and interest. And if I don't do that, listen, I'm undermining the marriage. It's headed for the rocks from the get-go. Sometimes we get married just simply because of what that person can do for me. They make me feel good. They make me look good. They do what I want. So it's, it's, it's back to being all about you. You shouldn't have ever got married. I'm not, I'm not saying get out. Please don't understand me. But I'm, just, I'm telling you, your, your marriage is rocky, and you're rocky because you're a selfish person. And if you're going to be a selfish person, do not get married. Do not. It is not a home for, for selfishness. Or I should say, it won't stay a home for selfishness. It'll either kick you out, or you'll kick it out. But it will, they cannot hold in the same place. They cannot stay in the same place. Well, I just want to do my own thing. Okay, well, then don't get married. Just don't get married. Stay out of it. It's not for you. Marriage is not a sideshow. It is the main event. And if that's not cool with you, stay out. Stay out. And, and let me just say this. It, you know, in some ways, maybe I'm painting this whole issue of marriage. Will I just lose myself and my individuality? No. You're going to find out more about yourself. You're going to have a greater experience of who you are as an individual within a proper marriage. God created marriage because it was not good for Adam. Adam was not going to find out about himself and be all that he could be by himself. Now, I'm not saying that as a slam to all the single people I have in here. Please don't feel like that. Sometimes, sometimes we're single because we need to be single. Sometimes we're single because God has called us to be single. And you certainly shouldn't get married apart from God's call upon your life. And please understand, as a single person, God is perfectly capable of being all that you need. But, but in, in, in the original... In the original, God created Eve because that's what Adam needed, and Eve needed him. That was the original. We live in a sinful world and full of sinful people, and a lot of selfishness going on, and in many cases the best choice is not to get married. It's not. But, but, so you need to hear God's call in that and understand that he's bringing you into that, but again, it's pre predicated on the whole thing of, do I have actually a relationship with him that is ongoing and dynamic and life-changing? And it's from that relationship that comes the next step in, in maybe my relationship to other people here in this world, but it's got to start there. Got to start there. So cleave, listen, back to that. It's the same word used elsewhere in the scriptures, believe it or not, for an alloy. You know what an alloy is? Take two different kinds of metal, get them super hot, liquidified, pour them together, allow them to solidify, what you wind up with is called an alloy. El on the elementary level, they remain separate metals, but you cannot separate them. You cannot. They're an alloy. Most of you are riding around on alloy wheels. You're riding around in an alloy car uh, made of different kinds of metals because what happens is you take this kind of metal, it's got its weaknesses, and this kind of metal, and it's got its kind of weaknesses. You b combine them together, and they sort of eliminate each other's weaknesses. That's marriage. 
That's what it is. But it cannot be separated apart from huge heat and otherwise chemical reactions. So what is marriage? Here's another one. It's the dissolving of two into one. That's what it is. It's the dissolving of two people into one. You say you don't like that. Well, I say don't get married. Because that is biblical marriage. Part, part of our problem is, is that God's math doesn't work for us, right? Be joined together and they, they, the two of them, shall become one flesh. So how do I get, here we got people going back to school. When did y'all start already? It's Monday. So sorry. <laughs> so one plus one equals Hmm? Come on. Three. Glad, glad school's starting. One plus one equals two, right? That's the way the math works. We have a hard time with God's math because we look at that. Listen, he's not talking math. He's talking chemistry. Cleave is not a math thing. It's a chemistry thing. It's a melting of two and putting them together. It's chemistry. You melt two and they become one. They become inseparable. Jesus backs us up on this, right? They are no longer two. Is Jesus right every time he speaks? I think he is. Jesus, they're no longer two, he says, but one flesh. Well, therefore God is joined together. Let no man separate as if you could. A marriage document or the, the crossing out of one does not satisfy it. So, so, so first, first leaving and then receiving and then cleaving and then finally weaving. The two shall become one flesh. This is a, a lifetime process. It's a process that God takes us through where we become more and more uh, the place of intimacy on every level. You know them and they know you and you, you, they know your needs and they want to always make you happy and makes you sad and you've accepted it, them and, and they're accepted on no matter what and it's bigger than friendship. Bigger than friendship. I, I've had people say, oh, this, my, my wife is my best friend. I think that's an understatement. I mean, yeah, she's my best, best friend, but I, I've never had, never had a friend I want to get in the same sleeping bag with. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> uh-uh. <laughs> Marriage is not the same. It's more than physical. I mean, it's on every level. It's on every level, not the same. It's more than friendship. It is oneness. It is one that's created in the image of God. God is one, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. That's the same word, by the way. Oops. I'm so good, I forget where things are. It's the same word right here about one flesh. When it says God is one, it says they are to be one. Now there's two of them, right? How do they become one? The same way that God, who is three, becomes one. God is completely unified. So we have in the image of God that God created us the, the, the expectation of what it means to be one. That they're the same mind, of the, the unity of mind and body and spirit. That's what God, that's marriage. That's what marriage was created to be. But no longer two. One. Mar marriage is not a contract. It's a It's a covenant. A contract is I do your, my part and you do your part and we have 50%. And it's like oil and water. You shake them up, no matter how much you shake them, they're eventually going to go back to their separate places. It's, a, it's not a contract. It, it, it is a covenant. The two become one. And um, I couldn't think, oil and water was a great illustration. I couldn't think of a better illustration other than to say two, two potatoes that you cook and mash together. Put them in a blender. That's marriage. It's a sad illustration, I know. That's marriage, though. That is marriage. You're never getting those potatoes separate again, ever. That is marriage. Again, it's not something that you do. It is what God does. It is a process. So I'm going to undo what God has done? No, you're really not, ever. Ever. So finally, it's all accomplished. We've already said this all the way through. The, 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 by, by dependence and not independence from the one who created it. But we can't just tie ourselves to a process or to a, a list of things. No, it's, it's tying ourselves to the one who created the list. It, it's in him that I find my marriage. It's in, it's in him that I, that, I, that I make relationships right, including most especially my marriage. Only in him. So when we distance ourselves, listen, from him, we distance ourselves from the power of the things that hold us together. And why isn't marriage working? Because that's why, right there. It's not rocket science, for sure. Make sure Jesus is there. 
Make sure he stays in the midst of the marriage. There, there was a little boy who, who sat through Sunday school class, six years old, and children's Sunday school class, and he was, uh, the teacher was teaching about how Jesus attended the wedding uh, banquet and changed the water into wine, right? Remember the story? And so the father, on the way home, was asking the little boy what he learned, you know, of this kind of a, kind of a tough uh, a story to gather, you know, water to wine and marriage for a six-year-old boy, and what does he get out of that? And so he was asking, you know, he says, what did you, so when they went home, he says, dad asked him what he had learned from the story, and the boy thought for a moment, and, and then he turned and he answered, he says, I think pretty much what I learned is, is if, you're, if you're getting married, make sure Jesus is there, he said. <laughs> pretty good advice. Pretty good. Let's pray together. Lord, in everything, we need to make sure that you're there. We need you for our marriage. We need you for our personal life. We need you for um, our work life, our day-to-day, -day, our relationship with our friends. We need you for our finances. We need to make sure you're there. And, and, and part of our problem, if we've, if we've got problems, and we do, is because we're not, you're not there. You're not letting you in. And uh, we're not listening to you when you do speak to us. We're not letting you rule. We're not following your rules. We're taking your commands as suggestions. And uh, we think we have a better understanding how things ought to work. And we find ourselves following the, the best advice that society has to offer us. And, and we find ourselves coming up empty. In, empty and, and there's no, um, should be no amazement as to why that's happening. Lord, we so desperately need you to rule and reign in our marriages. We need you to remove from us our selfishness, God. We all suffer from it. We need to realize that marriage isn't just one thing that we do. It is the central thing that we do. And everything projects as married people out from that. And Lord, we need to know and be depend completely dependent upon you and have you at the center of all of it. God, we're asking for your help in that. We need your intervention to rescue our, us and rescue our marriages and rescue our marriages from us from the things that we do god we're asking for that today thank you for speaking to us today thank you for working we ask you to work as as we worship together we pray these things in jesus name amen thanks for visiting find us at www.islandbaptist.org